good morning or almost afternoon to everyone. This is from the uh, extension of the uh, uh, National Distance University from Tudela. I've been asked to present this activity. Today we will present the uh, alternative economy uh, event organized by Economists Without Borders. We collaborate with them since 2008, at least. And in this same gathering some years ago, we uh, provide them all of our support and collaboration uh, for this fantastic event. This year, of course, because of the pandemic, we couldn't have a, a physical encounter, but we're adapting ourselves to the online format. We hope it will be just as fruitful and productive. And we want to thank uh, Economists Without Borders for their effort, their collaboration with us. And about this event, I won't say very much. Uh, Freist will speak to you more about that. But in the context in which we find ourselves with the pandemic, we always talk about possible economic models and the pandemic has highlighted the problems of the current economic system at a global level. And these very problems have grown, I think. So, so I think this event, this encounter is especially relevant this year. And without further ado, uh, I will pass you to Freist from Economist Without Border, and she will talk about her the relationship with us. And uh, I wish you the very best for this event. Thank you very much, Emilio. Welcome to everyone. Though this is an online format, we can at least, alas, we cannot see our, each other. I'd like to mention something about uh, this online format. You can make comments, reflections, and questions through the chat. I will be moderating this first session. I will gather up your contributions. And once Jason's uh, conference is finished, I will pass him those questions and we'll try to generate a debate in that way. I'm sorry that it, this is the format, but uh, seven years ago, or we have been having these events for seven years to reflect upon uh, the economic systems we uh, aspire to. Starting today, we will be talking about the limits of economic growth. And in the afternoon, we'll present the diagnostic that we've uh, uh, developed about the uh, teaching of econ economics in the university. How econ econ economics is taught in the university uh, dictates the tools that people the upcoming generations that have to confront these issues uh, are carrying. In 2007, we began to reflect about the role of the state and, uh, and state tax systems. And we have ended up talking about the equality of opportunities. So while we have an online uh, format this year, we are in the networks with the hashtag so if anyone wishes to use those, uh, without further ado, I will leave you with Jason Hickel, who's an economic anthropologist and member of the International Inequalities uh, Institute and a professor at Goldsmiths in the University of London. So I leave you with Jason and then afterwards we will have the debate. Thank you very much. Okay, hello, it's, um, it's very good to see you all. Uh, thank you so much for the for the welcome and for the introduction. Um, I, I apologize that we're not able to be in person having this conversation. It's always richer in person, of course, but um, but I look forward to engaging with you as much as possible um, uh, in this format and with your questions afterwards. I'm just going to share my screen. So give me a second to do that. Um, hang on. Okay. So what I want to talk to you about today is, is the concept of degrowth. Now, this is going to be a new concept to many of you. Maybe others have, have, have heard it kind of floating around here and there over the past few years. Um, it's, uh, it's gone from being quite a marginal concept about a couple of decades ago, uh, and today is um, extremely popular and is really kind of capturing attention as, as a way of, um, as, uh, as an imperative, really, when it comes to addressing the crisis that we face in terms of 
uh, climate breakdown and other forms of ecological breakdown. So what I want to do is I want to give you a brief kind of overview of what we mean by degrowth. I know for some of you it might sound strange and counterintuitive, maybe even scary and wrong. Um, so hopefully we can address some of those concerns. Um, and I know you'll have a million questions that pop up. And so please feel free to ask any questions that you need answered. Uh, my job is to, is to help you um, uh, walk through that process, okay? So I want to start by just kind of setting the stage with where we are in terms of what's happening to our world today, okay? So <clears throat> this is a graph of, of CO2 emissions over the past 200 years. And what we see is that, of course, during, you know, during a period of the Industrial Revolution, beginning in the late 1800s, um, we see this extraordinary explosion in the use of, of, uh, of, 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 um, of fossil fuels and uh, resulting emissions from that, okay? Um, especially after the 1950s, as the objective of GDP growth is entrenched um, as government policy um, virtually everywhere in the world, okay? And, and, and this is the world that we live in right now where we have uh, escalating CO2 emissions um, being driven in large part by, um, by the imperative of economic growth, right? We'll discuss this shortly. Now, of course, the consequences of climate breakdown are not, are not just changes in temperature. Um, you know, we talk about one, two, three, or four degrees, but the consequences actually are quite severe in terms of the stability of earth systems and of societies as well. So, so some of the ways that we see this playing out, of course, and this is hopefully familiar to most of you, um, you know, we're seeing extreme storms. Uh, we hear about these all the time in terms of what's happening with hurricanes in the east coast of the USA and the Caribbean and so on. Um, heat waves, which have um, been a, a severe issue in parts of Europe and also in the Middle East and in, um, and in North India and so on. Uh, in some cases, single heat waves will kill up to 10 or 15,000 people. Um, droughts are becoming uh, increasingly problematic. Uh, droughts in the Northeast of Africa have, um, have, uh, have, have recently killed off 70% of livestock in Somaliland, for example, which is a, a devastating humanitarian catastrophe. We know that on our present trajectory, which is heading towards three or four degrees of global warming by the end of the century, um, most of Southern Europe will turn into a desert similar to, uh, to, um, to deserts in North Africa, for example, okay? Um, and, and drought will be a more or less permanent part of, of, uh, of life in Southern Europe, including Spain and Italy and, um, and Greece. Uh, wildfires, I mean, we're, we're seeing devastating wildfires in recently Australia, which you know, on kind of an apocalyptic scale, um, also on the West coast of the USA, um, uh, not just driving human displacement, but also driving um, uh, mass death. Uh, crop collapse is probably the single most concerning issue that we have when it comes to climate breakdown. We know that um, on our existing trajectory, we're looking at, um, at crop yields declining at about 30, uh, by about 30% um, from existing levels, uh, um, which is, um, which is uh, a significant problem when it comes to you know, food security, possibility of famines, and the instability that follows uh, from that. Rising sea levels. Um, this is already happening. It's already displacing people. Uh, by the end of the century, we're looking at sea levels going up by another one or two meters. And, and that's, it. that's within the lifetimes of people who are, are being born today. Okay, so this is not some distant, um, some distant future. This is this century. Um, again, at, at our existing trajectory of hitting three or four degrees. And of course, species extinction rates. Um, uh, at three or four degrees, we're looking at around one third maybe as many as one half of, of all existing species going extinct, which um, puts us in the realm of a kind of mass extinction events. Uh, this, is, um, this is a severe problem for the stability of our biosphere. And of course, human displacement will be, a, will be a major problem as well. This is already happening and we're seeing this on unprecedented levels already um, uh, from parts of Central America, people being forced to migrate north to find more habit, habitable land. Um, uh, we're seeing conflicts being driven by, by human displacement in, um, in parts of the Middle East. Uh, on our existing trajectory, we're looking at about one point, uh, at least 1.5 billion people being displaced um, from their homes by, uh, by the end of the century, uh, simply because um, you know, parts of the planet will become increasingly uninhabitable. Okay. Um, it doesn't take much to recognize how, how destructive that, that tendency in and of itself will be in terms of uh, generating political instability and, um, and, uh, and conflict, okay? So we call this the Anthropocene, right? 
Um, and by that we mean this is a, a, an era of geological instability being driven by human activity. But in fact, this term, the Anthropocene, is incorrect um, because it's not humans as such that are causing this crisis. Rather, it's a particular economic system that has only been around for about 500 years, that being capitalism, right? So human beings have been on this planet for 300,000 years in our present form. Uh, capitalism has been around for about 500 years. And it's only since the rise of capitalism that we've really seen the kind of multi-front ecological catastrophe um, unfolding on, uh, on a planetary scale. So that's one reason why the term Anthropocene is incorrect. It's more accurately described as the capitalocene, right? It's a particular economic system that's, that's driving this crisis. But the other key thing to recognize here is that not all human beings are equally responsible, right? In fact, the majority of this crisis is being driven by a relatively small number of rich nations. Um, and the majority of the consequences are harming, uh, are harming the rest of the world who contribute very little to the problem. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Look at this graph, for example. Uh, this rectangle shows uh, total excess emissions globally in excess of the safe planetary boundary of 350 parts per million, right? So it tells us which nations and regions of the world have contributed uh, most to those excess emissions, which are driving climate breakdown and who are therefore responsible for the consequences. What we see when we look at it this way is that the USA is single-handedly responsible for 40% of global excess emissions. The European Union is responsible for 29% of global excess emissions. And the global north as a group, that being USA, Canada, um, Europe, Japan, uh, uh, Russia, are collectively responsible, and Australia, are collectively responsible for 92% of global excess emissions, right? Uh, so a small number of, of rich countries in the global north are driving this problem. The global south, which has the, the vast majority of the world's population, has contributed only 8% to, to this problem, okay? And yet the global South suffers 92, uh, um, more than 90% of the consequences in terms of the costs of climate breakdown and about 98% of the deaths, okay? So 98% of all the deaths caused by this, this crisis already are happening in the global South, even though the global South has contributed virtually nothing to this problem, right? So we have to, it's important that we see this, uh, this crisis as a process of atmospheric colonization. We have a safe atmospheric commons, which we share, um, and a small number of rich nations have gobbled up that safe commons and have exceeded it, effectively stealing atmosphere from the rest of the world. Um, and so it's important that we recognize the colonial dimensions of the crisis that we face, right? We can also see this, this crisis unfolding like this, right? If we look at these two different maps, on the top, we have a map of the, of, of the world's countries with, the, with those countries that contribute most to overshoot emissions uh, in red, okay? So we can see the USA here, we can see Western Europe, Russia, um, Australia, and so on. The countries that are in green have contributed no excess emissions. They're within their fair share of the planetary boundary, right? Now look at the bottom map. The bottom map shows us uh, the world's countries coded by their vulnerability to climate change. And what we see is that the countries that are most vulnerable are in Latin America, in Africa, and in South Asia, right? So the very regions of the world that have contributed least to this crisis are the ones that are suffering um, uh, most in terms of the consequences and in terms of, the, of their vulnerability, okay? So if, you know, if our analysis of global ecological breakdown is not attentive to the colonial dimensions of this crisis, then we're fundamentally missing the point, right? Now, crucially, uh, climate is not the only crisis we face. Um, we're also facing ecological breakdown on, an, on a, a, um, a series of other important fronts. Um, we can see this in the, in the form of deforestation. We know that you know, 50% of, of the planet's mature tropical forests have been destroyed since 1950. And on our existing trajectory, the rest will be gone by 2050 in the next 30 years, okay? Soil depletion. Scientists tell us that about 40% of the world's topsoils are degraded or depleted. And they give us about 60 years left of harvests um, uh, on our existing trajectory, okay? So soil depletion is a major crisis for, um, for human civilization. 
Uh, and this is being driven by excessively intensive industrial agriculture and, 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 heav and heavy chemical inputs and so on. Okay. Ocean dead zones uh, sprawl across the, the marine territory on the coastlines of industrialized nations um, where very few marine species can live because of the chemical pollutants, primarily due to runoff from industrial farming through the rivers and into the sea. Um, we're also seeing fish stock collapse on a really um, destructive scale, mostly as a result of uh, intensive industrial trawling. Okay, uh, So about 85% of global fish stocks are in decline. Um, some fish populations like haddock are only about 1% of their former volume. Okay, So ex extremely destructive levels of fish stock collapse. Insect die-offs is another major problem. Across Western Europe, we've been seeing data coming out recently in the past few years about um, insect biomass declining by about 75% over the past couple of decades, an extraordinary rate of insect population collapse. And of course, this, these are just facets of a broader trend in mass species extinction. Uh, we know that the, the rate of species extinction at present is about 100 to 1,000 times faster than prior to the Industrial Revolution. Okay, So apart from anything else, our economic system is driving a full frontal assault on non-human beings and living ecosystems on which we depend for our survival. Um, one of the ways that we can see all of this happening at the same time is with, this, uh, is with this framework known as the planetary boundaries framework. This is probably the most uh, important innovation in ecological science and earth systems research over the past few decades. And hopefully most of you are familiar with this, but if not, I urge you to, uh, to look into it. Um, what it does is that uh, it shows us um, where humanity is placing pressure on the Earth's uh, um, uh, biological and geophysical systems uh, beyond what are considered to be safe thresholds, okay? So um, it's looking at everything from climate change to biodiversity to land system change, uh, freshwater use, biogeochemical flows like phosphorus and nitrogen, which are, um, come from industrial farming and so on, okay? Where you see we're in the green, we are in a safety zone. Where you see we're in, a, we're in the yellow, we have overshot what scientists define as safe planetary boundaries. And where you see we're in red, we are in a, we are in a zone of, uh, of dangerous uncertainty at risk of triggering potentially irreversible uh, uh, tipping points in the Earth system. Okay? And so as you can see, you know, climate is only one of the crises we face here. Um, we're overshooting a number of other planetary boundaries as well. Right? Now, what this gives us is a new way to think about the question of limits. Um, in the past, in the 1970s, for instance, um, discussions about the question of limits to growth focused primarily on this, on this idea that we might run out of resources at some point in the future, and therefore uh, economic growth is going to slow down um, and stop and maybe even decline, right? Uh, but that was... Um, that's a problematic way of thinking about limits because typically you're able to find new kinds of resources to substitute the ones that are being depleted. And, and, that, and that, that's in fact what's been happening. And so the problem here is not that there are limits to growth in the sense of growth is going to hit some kind of wall in the near term and we're going to, and it's going to stop. Rather, the problem is that there are not limits to growth, okay? Um, so, and, and what I mean by this is that, uh, is that the economy just keeps, just keeps finding ways to expand and is degrading our biosphere in the process, okay? So um, a more rational way to think about this is not that we need to wait around or try to predict some kind of future limit to growth. Rather, we need to find ways to impose those limits ourselves so that we can keep our economy operating within planetary boundaries and in balance with the living world, okay? So, uh, so we, shouldn't, we, we shouldn't wait around for some kind of crisis to happen in terms of the economy. The crisis is already happening in terms of our ecology and we have to respond accordingly and readjust the way the economy works, okay? So one of the ways that we think about and measure the total impacts that, that, the, uh, that the economy has on the planet is with an indicator known as global material footprints or raw material consumption. And what this indicator does is it tallies up uh, the total weight of all the materials that we extract um, and produce and consume uh, every year globally. And what we can see um, is that this is what it looks like, right? Uh, and so this, this is counting everything from, uh, from fish, you know, from fish uh, to, um, to livestock, uh, 
to, uh, to timber, to fossil fuels, to um, coal, uh, to you know, pretty much everything we can see in plastics, everything. It adds it all up and what we can see is that there's been a steadily rising trend in global material use. The red line you see here is, is what scientists consider to be a safe planetary boundary, right? Uh, a sustainable threshold for material consumption. And what we can see is that we, um, is that we blew past that boundary in, um, in about uh, the late 1990s and, and resource use has been accelerating since then. There was some hope at the time that because of efficiency improvements and a shift to, uh, to, um, to knowledge-based and service-based economies that global resource use would start to decline. That has not been happening. It's been accelerating. It's been going up at a faster rate than ever before in history, okay? We're now at about 100 billion tons per year, which is more than uh, twice over the, uh, the safe uh, sustainable threshold. And the reason this is being driven um, at this rate is because material use is very tightly connected to GDP. And this is what uh, um, the relationship between the two looks like. Uh, the more we grow the economy, the more materials we use, right? And this relationship has been true for the entire history of capitalism. Uh, during the 1990s, we saw some of what we call the relative decoupling. Uh, but in the 21st century, we've seen, uh, we've seen that resource use has actually been rising at a faster rate than GDP. And so in, instead of there being a dematerialization of our economy, which some economists hoped for, there's, um, an, uh, there's increasingly a rematerialization or a recoupling of our, our economy, okay? And this is a very dangerous trend. So crucially, um, here again, what we see is that the problem of overshoot uh, is due almost entirely to overconsumption in a handful of rich nations, right? And we can see that when we look at the graph this way. This shows uh, total material use in per capita terms, right? Uh, by countries grouped by income. And what we can see is that low income nations and lower middle income nations consume very little, um, only about two, three or four tons of stuff per person per year. The sustainable level is about seven tons of stuff per person per year. And so they're way under that sustainable boundary. They have lots of room to maneuver. Upper middle income countries consume at about the sustainable level but high income countries uh, consume about four times over the sustainable level. So about 28 material tons of stuff per person. And they are also responsible for the vast majority of the growth of, um, of new material use over the past few decades since 1990. So what this means is that if we were all to consume like the average person in the rest of the world, then we would not be in a condition of ecological breakdown at all. We would be within planetary boundaries. And that's a remarkable fact. Um, overshoot is being driven almost entirely by rich nations. And if we were all to consume at the level of rich nations, then, uh, then we would need, uh, we would need four, the equivalent of four planets to sustain that kind of consumption, okay? So here too, we see the colonial dimensions of, um, of the ecological crisis. And crucially, uh, crucially we know that, that excess resource consumption in rich nations uh, depends on resource extraction from the global south. Right? So growth in high income nations relies on a net appropriation of resources from the rest of the world. Uh, and in 2015, um, which is the latest data we have on this, there, uh, we can see this in the empirical record with a net flow of 12 billion tons of raw materials going from the South to the global North, right? Uh, that's a net flow. Uh, so, so um, you know, the, the consumption that we all enjoy in our lives, everything from our iPhones to our, uh, to you know, our, our cars, whatever it might be, most of the materials from that, you know, for that come from the global south. And so uh, in the process, what's happening is that the ecological impacts of, of excess Northern consumption are being offshored to the global south. So the suffering is happening there. And we can see that in the form of you know, deforestation in the Amazon or in Indonesia is being driven by excess consumption in rich countries, okay? Now, uh, this crisis is being, is being caused ultimately by our economic system, which is capitalism. Now, uh, let's think about what we mean by capitalism here, okay, before moving on. Uh, quite often when we think about capitalism, we think about, oh, this, this is defined by markets and businesses and trade and so on. In fact, that's not true. Uh, markets and businesses and trade uh, all existed for thousands of years prior to capitalism, right? Uh, what distinguishes capitalism is a couple of key features that are worth pointing out here. 
The first is that capitalism requires what we call surplus extraction. What that means is that it has to take more from nature and from labor than it gives back in return, right? This is the primary mechanism of, uh, of, um, of growing profits is that you have to somehow find a way to depress the costs of labor and nature, which are your primary inputs so that you can appropriate the surplus from them, right? Now, what that means is that already, immediately, you're in a position where you cannot have a reciprocal relationship with, uh, with nature and labor, right? As a consequence, capitalism always drives crises of inequality and ecological breakdown, right? As an intrinsic consequence of, uh, of its need for surplus extraction, right? So it, it throws us immediately out of balance with the living world. And it's the first and only economic system in history that has been, uh, well, except for feudalism, actually, that has been organized around uh, this kind of intensive extraction. The second thing is that capitalism requires not just profit, right? Profits existed prior to capitalism, uh, but perpetual expansion, okay? So it requires ever increasing quantities of labor and nature to be pulled into these, circuit, these circuits of surplus extraction and accumulation, primarily by elites, okay? Now we refer to this process as growth. And this is where we, we really get to the nub of the issue. Um, when we think of the word growth, uh, you know, it sounds so good and so natural that we immediately buy into it and call for more of it. Uh, it has, uh, you know, an extremely strong ideological commitments on both sides of the political aisle, whether you're left or you're right, you might bicker about how to distribute the yields of growth, but on the question of growth itself, um, you're united, right? Virtually everybody believes that this is, that this is a requirement. Um, and I, I think it's important that we understand that the, the language of growth is effectively a kind of propaganda term, effectively a kind of ideology. And what I mean by that is that what's going on behind, you know, in reality behind the language is a process of extraction, exploitation uh, um, and appropriation for the sake of elite accumulation, okay? Um, and yet those processes are then, are then repackaged and sold to us as growth, which again makes them seem natural and gets us to buy into them, okay? Uh, so we need to be able to recognize the ideological dimensions of the concept of growth, right? Now, uh, let's move on to, to, to the key question that's before us which is um, to focus our minds on how to solve the climate crisis at hand, okay? Now, um, this is our existing state of play, right? This graph shows on the left-hand side in black, it shows um, rising historical global emissions over 50 billion tons per year, okay? And then the red line, the orange line shows uh, our business as usual trajectory. Uh, if we carry on without any changes, uh, we'll hit 4.2 degrees of warming by the end of the century. Scientists are clear that that level of global warming is incompatible with organized human civilization as we know it, okay? Now, we have the Paris Agreement since 2015. Under the Paris Agreement, nations make um, pledges about how much they will reduce their emissions from the baseline scenario, right? The blue line in this graph shows what happens when we add up all of the nation's pledges under the Paris Agreement. What we see is the pledges are totally inadequate. They do reduce emissions from the baseline scenario, but uh, they accomplish no absolute reductions in emissions over this period uh, to the point where um, emissions will continue to rise under existing commitments of the Paris Agreement, right? Um, to the point of reaching 3.3 degrees of global warming by the end of the century. Again, this is a violation of the Paris Agreement um, and is a level of heating that is incompatible with organized human civilization. Okay, so our existing plans are not adequate to solve this problem. Um, in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, published a report on what it would take for us to stay within 1.5 degrees of global warming. So this is within the safe level. Uh, um, and this is the image that they produced. Um, here we have rising historical emissions on the left, and on the right, we see what is required uh, globally in order to get emissions down to zero fast enough in order to stay under safe levels, okay? What this, um, what this, what this uh, requires is cutting global emissions in half um, in the next 10 years uh, and then reaching zero emissions globally by the middle of the century, okay? It would be impossible to overstate how dramatic uh, um, and aggressive this trajectory is. Uh, it represents nothing more than 
the total and rapid reversal of our existing trajectory as a civilization. Okay, when we look at this graph, um, we should find it extremely sobering. This is a kind of all hands on deck um, uh, crisis. Okay, now keep in mind that this is a global average target. Um, uh, high income nations like Spain, like the UK, like the USA, given the fact that they have contributed the vast majority of historical emissions have a responsibility to reduce their emissions much more quickly than the rest of the world, okay? And what that means is that according to scientists at the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, high income nations need to reduce total emissions to zero by 2030, okay? So in the span of one decade, uh, to be faithful to the Paris agreements, uh, high income nations need to totally replace their fossil fuel um, uh, infrastructure, which they built up over 200 years replace it entirely and overhaul it in, in a matter of 10 years, right? That, that is the task that is before us. Um, so the question becomes, is it possible for us to achieve this? Theoretically, the good news is that yes, it is absolutely possible. Um, and we can do it with something like a Green New Deal, right? And I'm sure that you all have been, have been hearing about Green New Deal policy. Uh, what it entails and what it requires basically is that we have a plan to actively scale down fossil fuels, okay? that we rapidly, that we use government policy to rapidly roll out renewable energy, okay? And that we accomplish a 100% transition away from existing methods of industrial farming to regenerative farming um, to eliminate emissions from land use change, okay? So these are the kinds of policies we have to have in the Green New Deal, um, absolutely. Now, and this represents a really important shift in our discourse because previously there was, a, there was the assumption that market mechanisms would be adequate to solve this problem. And we know now that we need active government policy in the form of a Green New Deal uh, in order to do this. Okay, so this is what we need to be calling for. Um, now, the question is this, uh, or the problem is this rather, we cannot accomplish this objective while growing the global economy at the same time. Okay, um, and here's the reason, is because 3% growth, which is, which is the normal rate of economic growth, um, means nearly tripling the size of the global economy by 2050, okay? Now we're used to hearing about 3% growth. It sounds very small, but because this is an exponential function, it grows very, very quickly. And so um, on our existing uh, trajectory of 3% growth, we roughly triple the size of the global economy by the middle of the, of the century in exactly the same time frame that we have to be reaching zero emissions, okay? So the question becomes this, can we decarbonize the entire global economy by 2050, while at the same time tripling its size? Okay, that's the question before us. And the answer uh, to this question is no. Um, all of the existing empirical data that we have shows that this is not possible to achieve. And here's the reason, right? Here's the crux of it. Uh, the more we grow the economy, the more energy the economy requires, okay? Because there's a very tight coupling between uh, growth and energy use. And the more the, energy, the, the more energy the economy requires, the more difficult it is to supply that energy with renewable alternatives, okay? So it's kind of like, uh, it makes our task much more difficult. It's like, we're doing this battle facing uh, uphill with our hands tied behind our backs, you know, blindfolded. It's much more difficult than it needs to be, okay? Um, as a consequence, most of the scenarios that we have for staying under 1.5 or two degrees rely on speculative future negative emissions technologies. The idea that we're gonna have a huge rollout of big machines that will somehow pull carbon emissions out of the atmosphere. Um, scientists reject this as, a, as an assumption. They believe it's extremely risky and unproven. Uh, and we need to focus on, uh, on actively reducing fossil fuel use and emissions, okay? Um, so uh, so in, 20, in the 2018 report of the IPCC, um, they pointed out what this, uh, what this would require in order to, to achieve. And what it requires is that we actively reduce global energy use by about 40% between now and 2050, okay? Now, the reason for this is because the less energy we use, the easier it is to accomplish a rapid transition to renewables. This is really the key principle that I, mu that I must underline. The less energy we use, the easier it is to accomplish a rapid transition to, uh, to renewables. Okay, this is the only feasible way to accomplish this transition, right? The question becomes, how do we do that? Now, this is not a matter of simply turning off the lights when you leave a building um, or taking you know, shorter showers or whatever it might be. 
um, the IPCC is clear and ecological economics is clear that the only way to do this effectively is to reduce uh, excess material production and consumption. Okay. Um, and the reason is because it takes an extraordinary amount of energy to extract and produce and transport all of the stuff that our economy consumes every year. So by doing less of it, we use less energy and we can uh, um, enable a, a much easier transition to renewables in the short time that we have left, okay? Now, this is uh, technically known as degrowth. And this is where we get to, uh, to the key concept here. Um, here's a definition of degrowth. Degrowth is a planned downscaling of excess resource and energy use that's designed to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a safe, just, and equitable way, okay? Now, notice here that the objective of degrowth is not to reduce GDP. The objective is to reduce uh, resource and energy use in high-income nations, okay? Now, uh, we have to recognize that doing so is likely to cause GDP to grow more slowly or to stop growing or even to decline. Um, under normal circumstances, that's what we call a recession. Degrowth is different from a recession because a recession is what happens to uh, an economy that requires growth um, in order to stay afloat. And of course, it causes all sorts of disasters. It causes people to lose their jobs, you know, businesses to go bankrupt, uh, poverty rates to rise, homelessness rates to rise, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of uh, human disasters are caused by recessions. Um, degrowth is, is fundamentally different, okay? Um, in that it, it's about shifting to an economy that doesn't require growth in the first place. That's the, the crucial distinction. So it's focused on reducing re resource and emissions use. If GDP declines, that's okay, because we're shifting to an economy that does not require growth in the first place. Okay. Um, now, this word, some people might find it to be a little bit um, challenging, let's say, right? We've been, we've been taught for so long that growth is good. Um, so when you hear degrowth, it sounds jarring. Why would we ever want to do something like that? So growth is so good, you know. Uh, the, the reason that the word degrowth is important is because it poses a direct challenge to the ideology of growthism. Again, we've recognized that, um, that, uh, that growth is effectively a propaganda term that, uh, that, that repackages destructive processes of extraction and exploitation, okay? Uh, what the word degrowth does is it exposes that fact and says, let's recognize what growth is really about. It's really about elite accumulation. Um, and we want to organize the economy differently, okay? Now, the good news is that degrowth can be accomplished while at the same time ending poverty and improving people's lives. In fact, this is the core principle of degrowth, okay? So again, while a recession causes human devastation, uh, the object of degrowth, the reason we have a different word for it is because it's organized around improving human flourishing, okay? Um, and this is really the, the crux of the matter. Um, and the reason this is possible is because we know for a fact that there is no causal relationship between GDP and human well-being, none. Uh, past a certain point, which rich countries have long since uh, surpassed, the relationship between GDP and human well-being completely breaks down. So we know, for example, that take the USA. The USA has a GDP per capita of $60,000, one of the highest in the world. Um, and yet Costa Rica, a uh, small country in, the, in, the, in Central America, um, has, uh, has one sixth or even one eighth uh, the GDP per capita of the USA, but they have higher life expectancy, better health outcomes, uh, higher levels of well-being, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And the reason is because of course, GDP doesn't matter. It doesn't count for anything uh, in and of itself. What matters is how income and resources are distributed. And in Costa Rica, they're distributed more equally and people have access to universal services, which are essential for human flourishing, okay? So GDP is not what matters. What matters is people's access to the resources they need to live uh, um, healthy, flourishing lives, okay? So what does degrowth look like? Let's think about some of the, the concrete policy um, options that we have before us to, to think about um, how to accomplish degrowth, right? The crucial thing uh, to understand is that this is not about um, individual behavior change. Okay, um, this is not about you need to compost more or you know uh, stop flying as much, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, of course, you know, doing those things is important, but ultimately that's not going to solve the problem because the problem is with our economic system more broadly. Okay, 
So this is ultimately about creating a new economic system, one that doesn't require growth in the first place. And we have to think about what that looks like. In order to get there, we need to ask ourselves, why is our system addicted to growth? Okay, we have to think about that. Uh, we have to think through this, this question. And there's lots of reasons we might, we might posit for this. One is that politicians, you know, are trained to see GDP as an indicator of success. Um, and so they do, you know, uh, elections uh, are, are won and lost on the basis of whether your policies are going to generate more GDP growth. Um, so politicians are incentivized to do this, okay, to make the GDP go up and that makes it seem like they, they have been successful. It's also because we know that, you know, people need jobs. Uh, and in capitalism, there's a particular problem that we face, which is that capitalism generates constantly increasing levels of labor productivity, right? And as you improve labor productivity, you require less labor in the economy to produce the same amount of stuff. And so you're constantly generating unemployment, right? This is why, you know, uh, the employment rate never goes down, <laughs> actually, um, despite growth. And so you have to, um, uh, you know, there's heavy pressure on governments to grow the economy, to create new jobs, just to mop up the unemployment created by productivity improvements in the economy, okay? But it's also because we, we've been told, we've been convinced that we need more growth to reduce poverty and improve people's lives. I mean, this is the main uh, moral justification for growth. And of course, we also know it's because we have to pay down our debts. So whether you're an individual or a household or a state, um, or a company, if you have debts, debts come with interest, interest is an exponential function, and to pay down an exponentially rising debt burden, you have to grow your business or your economy, okay? Beyond what you would otherwise require. So once we understand what the core drivers of the growth imperative, imperative are, we can think about how to address them, uh, almost like one by one. The first step would be to abandon GDP as an indicator of progress, and change how we think about economic success, okay? GDP is an extremely flawed measure because um, it measures the monetary value of all of the stuff that we extract and produce and consume every year, but it does not measure, it does not account for the costs of doing that. So if you cut down a forest for timber and sell that wood to Ikea, then GDP goes up, but it doesn't count the cost of losing that forest as a sink for carbon or as a habitat for endangered species or for human beings, okay? So um, we have alternatives though. One alternative is what we refer to as a genuine progress indicator. The genuine progress indicator starts with GDP and then subtracts negative social and ecological consequences of growth. And what happens uh, when we measure GDP against the genuine progress indicator or, gen or the GPI is we get a graph that looks like this. Um, the top line here shows rising GDP since 1950. And the bottom line shows um, uh, uh, the genuine progress indicator. We see that it rose along with GDP up until about the mid 1970s. And since then has actually begun to decline and stagnate, okay? So, um, so if politicians were using GPI as their main metric of success, they would be incentivized to uh, improve social outcomes while reducing ecological uh, consequences, okay? And that would really fundamentally change the way that our economy works, okay? Now, crucially, doing this alone is not enough. There's been a lot of talk these days about why GDP is a bad metric, why we need something more rational, why we need something better, um, and, and that's fantastic, you know? But, uh, but even if we change what we measure, still in the backgrounds, uh, resource use and energy use will continue to rise, causing ecological problems, um, because that's what capitalism requires, okay? So it doesn't matter what you measure. In a capitalist system, you're going to have uh, rising levels of resource and energy use, okay? So we have to be able to, to directly address that problem by introducing policy to actively reduce material production and consumption, okay? Um, and this is really where the rubber hits the road. Uh, in existing economic theory, the assumption is that every sector of the economy must grow all the time, regardless of whether or not we actually need it, right? What we need to do is have a more rational conversation um, about what sectors of the economy um, uh, we, do, we do need to grow, like renewable energy, public health care, public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. What sectors of the economy are big enough already and should no longer grow? And what sectors of the economy are too big 
and we should actively scale down. So things like SUV production, arms production, uh, industrial beef production, and so, and so on and so forth, right? Parts of the economy that we, we actually don't need. They're ecologically destructive and socially less necessary. So scale down those industries that we don't need. That's the first st uh, step to think about here, um, right? And this might also entail things like banning the practice of planned obsolescence. You know, we know that a, a huge amount of the stuff that we produce and consume is actually designed to break down in order to increase turnover, okay? So the lifespans of washing machines and dishwashers has declined dramatically over the past few decades to the point where today they only last about five or seven years, right? Um, if we extended those lifespans by a factor of say three or four, that means we would use one third or one quarter as many um, of those products. That's a vast material and energy savings, okay? Um, of course, it means a reduction of growth in the industries that use planned ob obsolescence. It means scaling down those industries and that's okay because we don't need them. Um, we can legislate extended warranties on products so that you know, every product that is produced uh, has a legal mandate to ensure that it lasts for the maximum possible lifespan. Okay? We can introduce rights to repair so that we can get our gadgets and other things fixed um, by ordinary repairmen rather than going to, uh, to you know, corporations that have proprietary rules and effectively incentivize us to buy new products rather than, our, than repair our existing products. Uh, I mean, Apple products are the quintessential example of this, right? We can ban food waste. We know that high income nations uh, waste about 50% of the food um, in the economy, uh, largely due to advertising campaigns that get consumers to buy more than they otherwise need. Um, and we can cut advertising expenditures, speaking of which, we know that there's a direct relationship between advertising expenditures and resource and energy use. There's also an inverse relationship between advertising expenditures and human well-being. Okay, we know that some cities like Sao Paulo have already tried cutting advertising in public spaces, and the consequences have been um, uh, extremely positive for, for both reducing excess resource use as well as for improving people's sense of self-satisfaction, happiness, and well-being, reducing anxiety, reducing stress, and so on. Okay. We can shift from private transportation to public transportation. This is an obvious one. I mean, in pretty much every respect, public forms of provisioning are less resource and energy intensive because we share them rather than private forms of provisioning. And that's true not just of transportation, but it's true of things like swimming pools, you know, gym equipment, whatever it might be. When we share things, when we have access to sharing things, then it's much, more, it's much less resource intensive than when we each have to purchase our own, okay? Um, ultimately, this requires, however, something like a declining cap on annual resource use, okay? And we can do that in a way um, that is fair and just with a kind of cap and dividend system uh, so, that, um, uh, so that poor households are not negatively affected by, um, by, by increasing expensive, increasingly expensive production, okay? Now, here's the, here's the tricky part, is that we know that as we scale down unnecessary or excess production and consumption, what this means is that key industries will decline, okay? If washing machines last four or five times longer, then the washing machine industry will decline. Now, the reason that we have heretofore not been able to conceive of, this, of, of such a thing is because we're afraid of unemployment, right? Um, and it's true that as these industries decline, then, uh, then unemployment will rise, but it doesn't have to. We can shorten the working week and distribute existing necessary labor more equally through the population um, so that we, we take the gains of uh, degrowth in the form of liberating labor time, right? The key, the key policy here would be to introduce a public job guarantee, right, with a living wage. And what this allows us to do is that once we have um, a guarantee that everyone who wants work can find it doing socially meaningful uh, work, say, um, installing renewable energy capacity or retrofitting houses or regenerating ecosystems or restoring woodlands or whatever it might be, uh, once there's a, a, a guaranteed access to work, then it takes the question of employment off the table. And once the, the, the question of employment is off the table, we can have an open conversation about what uh, industries you know, we can scale down or we should scale down without worrying about the specter of unemployment, okay? If you establish the job guarantee with a living wage, then it raises 
um, it raises wages across the private sector as well, um, and effectively redistributes income from capital to workers, okay? Uh, so that there's no loss to workers' livelihoods uh, in a degrowth scenario, okay? Um, and this brings me to a key point, which is that reducing inequality is a core principle of degrowth, right? Um, the crucial thing to recognize is that the problem is not that we don't have enough GDP. The problem is that, uh, is that all of it is captured at the top, right? The problem is inequality. There's no scarcity of GDP. Uh, there's, there's inequality, okay? Um, and so we can introduce things like, you know, uh, living wage laws, like I just described, or wealth taxes or other forms of progressive taxation or a maximum income ratio, such that, you know, like in Madrigan, the corporation Madrigan, where the highest paid executive can only earn six times more than the lowest paid worker in any given firm, right? Which um, automatically distributes income more fairly and prevents excess incomes from occurring in the first place, okay? Um, the key principle here is that we know that we can achieve our social goals right now without any additional growth at all, simply by sharing what we already have more fairly rather than plundering the earth for more, okay? So equality is a kind of antidote to the growth imperative, right? Um, it's, it's a more rational way of meeting our social goals uh, rather than, um, you know, rather than growth. And just to give you a sense for how unequally income is distributed, uh, take a look at this graph. Um, this graph shows the entire world's population on the bottom axis uh, by, in, by income uh, percentile. So the poorest people on the left and the richest 1% on the right. And what we see here is, um, is, uh, is, uh, is how much each group has gained in new income from global GDP growth over the past 40 years. What we see is that the richest 1% have gained about 25%, about a quarter of all new income from growth. The richest 5% have captured about half of all new GDP. Of all new GDP. And what that means is that um, half of all of the resources that we're extracting and all of the emissions that we're emitting and all of the labor we're rendering is going to make rich people richer. Right? This is an ecologically insane way to organize an economy. Um, by distributing income more fairly, we can accomplish our social goals uh, without needing more growth in order to do so. Okay. Another crucial pillar of a degrowth uh, policy packet is to expand universal public goods. Right? And the reason is because, um, is because we need to be able to ensure that people have access to the goods they need to live, to live well, access to healthcare, and education um, and, and transportation and so on without needing ever rising incomes in order to do so, right? So it's not income itself that matters. It's, uh, it's our access to the resources we need to live well, okay? And so if you compare, say, the USA, um, where uh, you know, if a household lives on 30,000 US dollars per year, then they will be in poverty because they can't pay for healthcare, they can't pay for transportation, they can't pay for education and so on. Compare that to Finland, where living on the same income, $30,000 a year for a household, would be luxurious because you have access to all of the things you need to live well, okay? Um, and, so, and so access to public goods or decommoditizing, you know, key social goods is essential to enabling us to live flourishing lives without needing ever, ever rising private incomes in order to do so. And then finally, we have to be able to think about debt, right? We know that debt is a major driver of the growth imperative. And so by canceling unpayable or unjust debts, we can, uh, we can remove some of that pressure for economic growth, okay? Um, now that might mean canceling student debts. It might mean canceling, you know, uh, household debt for poor households. It might mean canceling, you know, government debt for global South countries, whatever it might be. Canceling debt liberates us from the growth imperative, okay? Now, crucially, we also have to rethink the way our monetary system works because right now we have a fractional reserve banking system where the vast majority of the money that, that gets produced in our economy is created by commercial banks as debt, okay? Um, and debt of course has, you know, comes with interest and interest requires ever increasing uh, amounts of extraction and production in order to, to pay it off. And so um, by switching to a public money system or a positive money system, a debt-free currency, uh, we, can, we can liberate our economy from some of the growth uh, imperatives that come with our existing debt-based currency, okay? So this requires shifting away from a debt-based currency to a debt-free currency so that new money is spent into the economy 
instead of lent into the economy. Okay, and we can talk about that more if you'd like to. Um, just with some closing reflections here. Uh, um, first, I want to be able to, to recognize that, um, going back to my early observations, that our ecological crisis is fundamentally colonial in character. I think we, we need to be able to think of degrowth as a process of decolonization, okay? So as high income nations scale down excess extraction and production and consumption, they take pressure off a living world, but specifically they take pressure off of global South communities, okay? Um, and, and so I think that, you know, for those of us who care about a more just future and who, who want to see, you know, a reversal of these processes of ecological and atmospheric colonization, degrowth becomes an important rallying cry for global justice, right? Now, I want to recognize the fact that the kinds of policies that I've been calling for here um, are policies that are basically incompatible with capitalism as we know it. And on the face of that, that might seem scary. Um, I can understand that. I mean, you know, capitalism is all that we've known. And, uh, and so it, it's difficult to imagine something better, right? Um, you know, as Frederick Jameson said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. But, but we are, you know, it, it's strange that we are so afraid of thinking about innovating beyond capitalism because we are a culture that, that values creativity and innovation. I mean, we would never look at um, a smartphone or a painting and say, that's the best smartphone and best painting that's ever been produced and we should never try to improve on it. So why is it that when it comes to the economy, um, you know, we've been, we've been lulled into believing this is the best possible option and we should never try to improve on it. It's a kind of naive thinking. I mean, ultimately capitalism is, um, is a medieval system designed in the 16th century uh, and is not fit for us to carry into the 21st century in an era of ecological breakdown. We need to be more rational. We need to be able to innovate uh, and think beyond the constraints of capitalist imaginaries, okay? Um, uh, I think that's an important part of, of recognizing what's at stake. And this, and this does not mean, you know, going back to some failed 20th century version of totalitarian communism. No, we know that was an absolute disaster. Um, this is about, uh, you know, evolving into something fundamentally better, some, you know, something fundamentally different, um, uh, specifically an economy that is organized around human well-being and ecological stability, rather than around perpetual growth and elite accumulation. So I'll leave it at there and uh, at that, and I'll take your I'll take your questions now. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Jason. Eh, me está Thank you so much, Jason. It's difficult because there have been a lot of uh, conversations in the chat, a lot of interventions, and it's I'm trying to order them in a way that follows your presentation. I'm going to pass them to you. Mm -hmm. If there are too many, you let me know. But uh, also, you can continue writing those in the chat. Uh, and as Jason finishes his response, this is a, resp a mixture between reflections and questions. With respect to the first part of your your conference about uh, atmospheric colonialism, many of the participants were surprised that China wasn't mentioned, that on the one hand. Then there were specific questions about whether you were referring specifically to carbon-based energy. Why were you talking about uh, 500 and not 200? And also with respect to the quantity of energy that we use, they say that we're looking at countries like the United States, but others like India or in Africa and Latin America, in order to generate growth, they need a lot of energy as well. So what happens with, yes. with respect to that issue? So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yes, okay, these are very good questions. So China is a major emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, uh, in, in current annual terms, okay? Uh, but when it comes to climate change, what matters is not, um, you know, current annual emissions, but historical cumulative emissions. That's what leads to concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and so China has only, been, has only been emitting at a serious level for, you know, uh, for a relatively short period of time. So um, the metrics I was giving you, 
uh, show cumulative historical emissions because that's what's causing the problem. And when we look at when we look at it that way, then it's clear that uh, the EU and the USA are by far the largest contributors to this problem because they've been emitting intensively uh, for um, you know for 200 years, so or or close to that. Um, so yes, I mean it's absolutely necessary that China. I mean China has to reduce its emissions very rapidly, otherwise we're all cooked. USA has to reduce its emissions rapidly. When it comes to assessing the question of atmospheric colonization, um, this is a question of cumulative historical emissions. Uh, the process of industrialization um, relied not only on the colonization of uh, um, of the global south to get the raw materials necessary for uh, Europe's industrialization, like um, cotton and sugar and uh, and so on, uh, you know, timber and so on, but also it was also a process of atmospheric theft. And I think that's an important dimension here. Um, so to the other question about energy, yes, there, uh, there are lots of poor countries that definitely need to use more energy. That's absolutely crucial. And so when the IPCC calls for a 40% reduction in global energy, virtually all of that is in the global north, okay? Now, now here's, the, here's the important thing is that we know that the vast majority of the energy that, uh, that we use in the global north is in excess to human needs. A recent study that, that just came out was that high income nations um, could reduce their energy consumption by 90%, right? Uh, and still achieve, um, achieve universal healthcare and education and high standards of living for everybody, right? Uh, so so uh, um, we have to think about global reductions of emissions in terms of reducing excess energy use in high income nations rather than low in low income nations. So this is not about degrowth for poor countries. This is about degrowth for rich countries. Muchas gracias. Que estoy Thank you. I'm writing at the same time as I'm moderating. With respect to the ideological dimensions of the idea of growth, there are a series of reflections and also questions. For example, with respect to proposals that propo the, the participants are making, here's one. What would the role of a circular economy be within degrowth? What would happen if carbon credits were more expensive, for example? and uh, I have, uh, I'll leave it at that because there are other blocks of questions. Okay. Um, yeah, circular economy is, is, uh, is an important idea and one that I absolutely support. Um, but the problem with a circular economy is that it's not compatible with growth uh, for, for two reasons, right? Like, um, we, you know, so clearly we need to try to make our economy as circular as possible. But in so doing, we are, we're effectively internalizing the costs of, of, um, of production, right? Because we're recycling more materials, um, and that makes materials more expensive. And this um, this this creates a constraint on GDP growth. So one of the reasons that governments have been very reluctant to introduce circular economy principles is precisely because it leads to lower rates of growth. Okay, and so um, it's easier to accomplish a, a circular economy in the context of a post growth economy. As long as we're addicted to growth then it's unlikely that we'll, we'll have the political will, if you will, to introduce circular economy principles. The other thing is this, is that, um, is that the problem with growth is that, um, uh, is that growth requires an ever increasing quantity of resources. And so even if we recycle some resources, there still needs to be virgin extraction in order to power growth, okay? So, and, and the rate of, of, of virgin extraction growth um, in our economy outstrips our ability to cover uh, you know, to improve recycling. Um, and that's why despite dramatic improvements in recycling over the past few years and decades, we're still seeing total extraction uh, continuing to rise. And that's because the scale effect of growth is outstripping our ability to improve recycling rates. Um, and so again, in a zero growth economy, uh, then we would be able to make our economy more circular um, than in a growth economy. Oh, there was a question, sorry, about uh, carbon, about carbon uh, pricing. Carbon pricing is, is a really important intervention. We definitely need it. Uh, the problem is that in all of the existing models we have, carbon pricing itself is not enough to, um, to, uh, to achieve net zero emissions without extremely high levels of, um, 
of, uh, of carbon prices, which again present a, a constraint to growth. So one of the reasons that governments have been reluctant to introduce high, you know, high carbon prices is because they're worried about impacts on growth. So again, once we, once we throw off the constraints of growthism, then we can have a rational conversation about carbon pricing. It has to be a key part of our, of our conversation, but ultimately um, what, what we need uh, is to reduce energy use because carbon pricing alone is not going to do it. Thank you. The next question of questions and reflections has to do with you, you talked about specific measures and said that the, the problem is the current economic system. And we talk a little bit about the role of different actors, the role of individuals, of companies, of states and governments. And here there are some interesting reflections in the chat. There are some people that don't agree perhaps with the minimalist role that you've attributed to individuals, that this isn't a matter of composting, to give an example. Uh, and then there's a debate of opposing opinions about the role of uh, taxes and governments. Some people say that this is the responsibility of companies, but that it, it's, there's no incentive for them to change their way of behaving but there are many participants who say that the principal role is that of the state. The, responsible fa the responsibility falls upon the governments that if this is going to change in different countries, for example, in Spain, there, there, there's a, a tax for the use of uh, photovoltaic panels, um, or if the benefits of a transition go to the big companies. So uh, the, the, there's a debate about it, uh, whether it pays off for them to uh, make this change. Some say it's the elite in the global North that have the political power in order to perpetuate this situation. And the question is what would be the pathway to follow, uh, to, to change that, to, to impact that. If you can respond to this general block about the roles, the roles of the different actors in this panorama, uh, the responsibilities of companies, individuals and governments in this panorama. Okay, um, yeah, these are good questions, thank you. So yes, I mean, uh, I'm very clear that I think that individual you know, behavior change is important. My argument was simply that it's not enough, right? So. And the reason is this, is because ultimately we live in an economy that requires ever rising levels of consumption. It requires it. In other words, if it doesn't get that, it hits a recession and things collapse. That's what a growth oriented capitalist economy does, right? And so in such a system, there's incredible pressure for, um, you know, placed on people to consume more beyond what they actually need. Um, and so even if we do say, you know, cut our beef consumption or cut flying, Capital, you know, because capital has to grow, it will find other ways to get us to, to consume more, or if not us, then somebody else, right? Um, and so it's this constant game of whack-a-mole where you make one decision to, to reduce your consumption of plastic or beef and capital has to find other outlets for growth somewhere else in the system, okay? So it's important to recognize that, um, that human beings become victims of the system. Like our behavior um, does not emerge ex nihilo, our behavior is, uh, is, is, um, uh, is produced by a system that requires perpetual rising consumption, right? And so until we address that structural driver, then we just keep blaming ourselves, blaming each other. Who composts better? Who recycles better? You don't, you fly too much, et cetera. Um, we fight each other when we should be fighting um, a broader system that is oppressing all of us, right? Um, so un until we start, uh, until, until we shift our imagination to focus on structural causes, we're not going to address this issue. I mean, discourse about individual responsibility has been going back to the 1960s and 70s. Hey, it's made no difference. Um, I mean, again, it, this is not to say that it's not important, but uh, we will continue failing. We will continue failing unless we have some reckoning with the way our economy works. Um, 
So, you know, neoliberalism wants us to, to feel, I mean, to, to address this problem by feeling guilty and focusing on individual behavior change. But think about the, um, the civil rights struggle in the USA, right? Uh, one of the most impressive transformations of a social system in history. Um, if, you were a, um, if you were living in segregation era USA in the 1940s, let's say, it would not be enough <laughs> for you to sit in your house or your apartments and try to not be racist, right? That would not do very much good. What you have to do is you have to get out, you have to organize with people, you have to create social movements, uh, put political uh, leaders in power, and ultimately overthrow racist laws. That's the only way to do it. And, and I think there's a similar problem that we face here, right? It's not enough to sit in our flats and try to be ecological. <laughs> we have to build a movement around transforming what is a fundamentally anti-ecological system, okay? Now, as far as the different roles, um, yes, I mean, corporations, of course, they have responsibility, but they too are also subject to growth imperatives that are quite often legal in nature. So in some countries, uh, CEOs have a legal obligation to maximize shareholder returns um, instead of doing things like uh, giving money back to workers in, in the form of wage raises or you know, regenerating ecology or whatever it might be. I mean, they don't have a choice about it sometimes. Um, in a capitalist system, you have to grow to pay back your investors with interest uh, or you die or you collapse, okay? So, so, so here again, it's a structural, a structural problem and, and just relying on corporations to be good is just not going to work. So we ultimately do need um, state intervention here uh, to change the incentives that corporations operate with, to abolish you know, shareholder value laws, um, to, uh, you know, to introduce you know, different objectives that corporations must pursue. Um, and ultimately, you know, as I proposed, to actively scale down corporate sectors that we don't actually need, okay? Um, I mean, do we need SUV production in our economy? The answer is no, we have to scale that down. A corporation that produces SUVs is not going to voluntarily do that. Uh, so that has to be uh, a directive that we collectively agree on. Gracias. Uh, Jason, tenemos un montón de preguntas. Thank uh, you, Jason. We have many, many questions. So I will be asking them bit by bit because as you speak, more questions come pouring in. The, deba the debate is heating up. I think it's interesting to go back to the question. There are some colleagues here who are saying, the, do you consider the uh, bio, eco, green consumption uh, is is a trap for an, in in ecosystemic terms? Another person asks whether this uh, your way of thinking isn't contradictory with sorry isn't. Uh, isn't in uh, in conflict with individual uh, initiatives like uh, crowdfunded efforts to reduce contamination. The I don't know if you want to enter into these reflections, and I also would like to throw out a question: Where would uh, a common basic income uh, fit into the whole scheme? Because the person who's asking this question says that the idea of there's a that people talk about a conflict between guaranteed work and a basic income. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Okay. All these are all good questions. Let me start with the question of um, of of basic income and the guaranteed uh, and the guarantee and the job guarantee. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not against the basic income. Uh, I think that it, it, it can be an amazing strategy, uh, but it, it comes with, in terms, of, in terms of our strategy, it comes with two problems. The first problem is that um, it doesn't have a lot of support in most countries, like it has minority support. And so while I support it, and maybe most of you support it, um, it's difficult to, to persuade non-supporters to adopt it. And the reason is because there's a very, there's, a, there's an assumption fixed in our minds um, 
that's uh, that's an income should only be associated with work. Okay, and so this idea that you would pay people to not work, um, uh, or the possibility that people might be paid and then not work, which we know only a minority of people would ever, uh, uh, you know, ever behave that way, um, is a kind of uh, it stops the debate. Okay, the second problem is that um, paying for a basic income uh, in in uh, in econometric models ends up increasing debt burdens a little bit. Okay, and so that's not necessarily a problem, especially if you believe in modern, modern monetary theory. But again, it can it can create a stop to the debate. A job guarantee um, is is more useful in a number of key respects. Okay, the first thing is that um, is that it's very very popular. Uh, job guarantee uh, polls at in the region of 70 plus percent virtually everywhere we've seen opinion polls, including in the USA and the UK. There's huge popular support for a job guarantee. Um, uh, another key reason it's useful is because we know that there's actually a lot of work to do in the economy right now. Like we have to, we have a lot of work to do in terms of restoring ecosystems and, you know, rolling out renewable energy and retrofitting houses. Um, and so on, and, and care and essential services. And, and this is not work that the private sector is going to undertake, okay? So we need some way of allocating labor, um, especially in the wake of coronavirus where people have, where, where we have an excess of unemployed labor. We need some way of allocating labor towards the things that we need to build, to build a flourishing society that is in balance with the living world. And a job guarantee is an amazing tool to do that. Um, uh, what's also important about it is that a job guarantee is much cheaper to run than a basic income program um, because it, you know, it produces value at the same time. Uh, and so wages are paid from the value that it produces effectively. Um, so you can, you can fund a job guarantee uh, for about 1% of GDP typically. Um, so, so these reasons basically make it like not necessarily superior, but in terms of strategy, when you're trying to build political demands, it's a little bit easier. Um, of course, we could also talk about linking a job guarantee and, and a basic income in some way. The two are not incompatible, they can go together as well. Um, so we, we can think about what that would look like. Um, uh, so as far as like, you know, crowdfunded efforts to improve ecosystems or whatever, I, I mean, I have nothing against that. That's of course a good thing to do. Um, this, this kind of local mobilization is really important actually. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to draw our attention to the broader structural drivers of our, of our crisis, okay? Um, as far as this, this question of green, of green consumption, yes, of course, I mean, it's, it's important that we shift our patterns of consumption to things that are less intensive. So instead of driving fossil fuel vehicles, we need to drive um, electric vehicles, okay? But, but ultimately, in a growth-oriented economy, there's a limit to how green products can be. And then the scale effect of growth means that, uh, that while you achieve some improvements in the short term, in the long term, um, resource use and energy use continue to rise, okay? Um, the scale effect of growth outstrips the efficiency improvements that we can achieve in terms of, re uh, in terms of reducing the impact of the products we consume. Uh, and so ultimately green consumption itself will eventually become brown consumption. <laughs> um, uh, and so what I'm calling for here is not just a shift from say fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles, but a shift to fewer vehicles altogether. And that's what degrowth is. And that's fundamentally different from just green consumption. Okay. So, you know, a shift from private vehicle use to public transportation is a degrowth uh, proposal, um, not just, you know, a green growth, uh, a green consumption proposal. Okay. Muchas gracias. Um, Thank so you very much. About going back to basic income, they ask, what do you think about the current of thought that says that uh, public income or a basic income is a way of keeping the population uh, asleep and so they don't intervene in the structures of power? Another asks that they ask whether you could ex expand a little bit more on the uh, the question of. Perdón. Um, la última pregunta. The last question was if they could you could broaden 
the concept of uh, guaranteed access to employment. Could you just explain a little better how that would work? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you've given me this opportunity. Um, uh, the first question about basic income. Uh, okay, so the question was, um, if you introduce a guaranteed income, then would that lead to a kind of political apathy in the population or something like that? Uh, yes, I think that one of the problems with a guaranteed income, and again, I'm not against it necessarily, but it does have some issues to discuss. One of the problems is that, um, uh, is that it doesn't actually address the fundamental um, maldistribution of income in the economy, okay? So um, it maintains elite overaccumulation and then taxes some of that to give it a back to, to, uh, to ordinary people, okay? And so the, the drivers of inequality are not addressed. They're just covered over, right? Um, what a job guarantee does is it fundamentally addresses those drivers by specifically by raising wages. So, so it reduces um, the possibility of elite accumulation in the first place, okay? Uh, now, another reason that's quite important is because, um, is because the efficacy, the effectiveness of a basic income depends on the level at which it's set. If it's set too low, then that means that it becomes like you still have to work in order to survive. And so it becomes a subsidy to employers and that exacerbates inequality, right? So, so employers get to pay you less because they know you have a basic income to live on. Um, a job guarantee, okay, so, so a basic income is only effective if the level is high enough to allow you to opt out of work altogether. But that, that kind of basic income is very difficult to get political buy-in for. Most people are against it, okay? Um, the job guarantee is different because it, um, it immediately raises labor standards across the board, okay? So if you, you can use the job guarantee to, um, to set a living wage for the job guarantee and, and set maximum hours at say 30 hours a week. And what that means is the private sector then has to meet those same standards because otherwise people will leave the private sector and go to the public job guarantee, right? After all, I mean, why would you work for less money flipping bur burgers for McDonald's doing something socially meaningless when you could be earning a living wage doing something socially useful like care or ecological regeneration or whatever um, uh, uh, and spend less time doing it, right? <laughs> Clearly people will opt for the job guarantee because it's better. People want to do this kind of work. Uh, so, so the job guarantee has the effect of changing, uh, of changing wages and working hours across the entire economy. And this affects a massive redistribution of income, uh, again, towards workers and towards more meaningful, safer kinds of work. Uh, so a job guarantee is, is more effective at doing that. Now, what would it look like? It would be federally funded. It would be funded by the, by the, by the government. And the reason is because, because the government has the ability to, um, to create money in order to fund public goods like a job guarantee, okay? Um, it has that ability, it has no constraints, at least uh, if it has sovereign control over its currency. Spain, unfortunately, does not have, because it's in the, in the Eurozone. Um, but even so, a job guarantee is not expensive to fund, okay? Uh, now, it would be, so it would be, it'd be funded by the government, but, it would be, but the kind of work would be determined um, at the community level. So this is not some, this is not some like bureaucratic Soviet make work system, okay? This is community oriented. Uh, communities know what needs they, they have, whether they need people to care for elderly people, uh, people to run a, a football team for local kids, um, if they need to restore a woodland or if they need to install solar panels for people's houses. Uh, communities know what kind of work they need to have done. So they can determine um, how the job guarantee works. The other, the other reason the job, the job guarantee is important is because it provides retraining uh, to shift people from brown sectors like fossil fuels or SUV production, um, for example, into green sectors like renewable energy and, um, and so on. And so uh, it's a just transition mechanism to ensure that nobody gets left behind as destructive industries are scaled down. Pues in in el hilo de esto, following the thread, this thread, they ask whether a guaranteed employment would entail a reduction in uh, the the uh, range of alternatives that any given individual would have, or in terms of their uh, their job orientation and their possibility of job placement. I think this 
if there would be less job orientation or if it would be different and directed to different fields of work. Yeah, so, so in existing job guarantee proposals, um, there's a wide range of different kinds of work that, that would be available to people. Um, and again, retraining programs would enable people to upskill in order to do that. Uh, so these are not necessarily low skilled jobs. It's not like flipping burgers at McDonald's, right? Um, uh, people would be trained to do quite high skilled things like to regenerate a woodland or an ecosystem requires you know, intimate knowledge of, of uh, biology and ecology and so on. So that training would be provided as part of the, the job guarantee. And so we would see the job guarantee would, would, would uh, improve the overall skill levels of the workforce, um, which and, and would reverse tre existing trends towards de-skilling. Uh, now, what's interesting about this is that um, I should emphasize over and over again: like the reason the job guarantee is so popular is because people know that they would prefer to be doing that kind of work than the kind of socially unnecessary bullshit jobs they're presently doing. Um, so, you know, from David Graeber, the economist uh, David Graeber, we know that uh, a huge proportion of the jobs in the economy are basically meaningless and unnecessary, right? Um, people are depressed at work. They, they recognize that it's not, they're not doing anything for the world. Um, pe people would actively prefer to choose jobs that are socially meaningful and socially necessary. And that's what a job guarantee allows us to do. And so, and so the power here is that it shifts us from labor being organized around exchange value for elite accumulation to labor being organized around use value for community need. And that's a very powerful transformation. That's, that's fundamentally, that fundamentally runs counter to the logic of capitalism, right? So why should we spend our lives uh, doing work, producing things that are unnecessary for the sake of rich people becoming richer when we could spend our lives doing meaningful, engaging work that is, that is improving our communities, right? To me, this is a powerful vision. Um, and, and not only that, but it's the, it's the single most powerful policy that we could introduce uh, in terms of ecology, because it would take the question of unemployment off the table. I mean, just imagine, once, once the question of unemployment is off the table, imagine the conversations you can have about what sectors you want to get rid of or scale down. I mean, it would, it would free us to have that conversation for the first time in 500 years. <laughs> uh, and that's, pow that's powerful. Like, um, this is essential to a democratic economy, is the ability to have a conversation about what we actually need. Okay, um, and the job guarantee enables us to do that. Personally, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. Now I'm going to ask you a block of questions. Going back to the present economic system, there are people who ask whether you consider that the rules of play of the current economic system have efficient mechanisms to guarantee the extraction and consumption of, of uh, resources, respecting natural uh, systems. Could be an efficient solution. And last, uh, do you think that the current uh, patent system that favors technological advance are an effective solution for society, well-being and prosperity without damaging the environment? In the current economic system, is there anything we can do the situation in we find which we find ourselves and that you have presented mm -hmm. yeah let's see if i can address this so I, I i'm not sure i understood all of the question but i think the question was about um efficiency improvements is that basically right um so so uh okay yes okay good so um Yes, you know, capitalism is extraordinary at producing efficiency improvements. Um, and that's, that's a very powerful element of, um, of, uh, of capitalism. The, the problem is, and that's good and we should embrace that, right? Uh, the problem is that, um, that in a growth oriented economy, uh, the scale effect of growth outstrips efficiency improvements. One way to think about it is, is like this. It's actually, it's, we, have, we have a term for it. It's called the rebound effects 
or the Jevons paradox. And what this means is that, um, is that when we improve the efficiency of production, when we get more output per unit of energy or resources, uh, then ultimately, paradoxically, they say, uh, total resource and energy use goes up, right? Now, we call this a paradox, but in fact, it's completely expected. If you imagine, um, take a soft drink company, take Coca-Cola, for example. If it finds a way to produce uh, um, aluminum cans with 10% less aluminum, okay, uh, it will definitely do that. It'll, it makes it cheaper to produce those cans. Now, we might say that's an important innovation that will reduce aluminum use, but in fact, aluminum use goes up. Now, why is that? It's because the savings that the company gets from making more efficient cans, they then invest in expansion. I mean, the point of innovation uh, for efficiency is to generate growth. If you ask any economist, uh, you know, what does uh, efficiency improvements do? They'll tell you it generates more growth. That's why efficiency is important, right? And so, and so Coca-Cola will take the savings from uh, the, can, the, the aluminum can improvements and then invest that in advertising campaign, campaigns, for example, to get us all to buy more Coca-Cola. Or maybe they'll, they'll advertise in a new country and get people there addicted to Coca-Cola or something like that. So um, because the purpose is expansion, right? And so, so in an economy that is organized around expansion, efficiency improvements don't, don't lead to net reductions of resource and energy use. Now, in an economy that is zero growth, then what happens is efficiency improvements do lead to net reductions of resource and energy use. And so this is why we should aspire to a steady state economy because uh, in an economy that does not need to grow, um, then efficiency improvements deliver us the gains that we expect them to, okay? Um, that's one thing to say, I think. Uh, so this is why we can never expect that efficiency improvements will automatically deliver um, reductions in ecological impact in and of themselves, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, so, uh, right, I guess that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Uh, I've been looking for the chat. This um, may be the last question. When you finish, we're we will be finishing this Q&A. They ask uh, about your opinion about the uh, current uh, migration crisis, people coming from Africa to Europe. And according to you, which could be the best solutions, uh, short and middle term? Yeah, OK. So. Um... So, so first, I mean, the first thing uh, is to recognize that the migration crisis that's happening right now is, is, is largely an effect of our growth addicted economy. <laughs> um, and the reason that's true is because, you know, as I pointed out, parts of the global south are being sabotaged for the sake of, of, uh, of growth in the north, right? Now, whether that's deforestation or whether it's the effects of, you know, of ecological breakdown or climate change and droughts and so on, um, or whether it's wars that are fought over access to oil because we need oil for more growth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like, like all of this destabilizes human communities. Um, it's not surprising that in, uh, that in an economy that is fundamentally out of sync, like fundamentally unstable, some fundamentally out of sync with ecological principles, that we're going to get human displacement, right? And so we can try to address, uh, you know, uh, um, human displacements with uh, near-term policies, and of course we should. But if we're not thinking about the broader structural drivers, and I think we're missing a key point here. Um, so, but in terms of near, in terms of near-term policies, I think that um, that here again, something like a job guarantee is absolutely essential. Okay. Um, or a basic income, whatever you want to pick. But, but the reason is because right now we have a scarcity mindset, okay? So the idea is that when immigrants come into Europe or whatever it might be, um, uh, this is a problem because they're taking our jobs and taking our public services, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Th this is a scarcity mindset that is totally unnecessary. And it's, it's there because our economy is organized around scarcity, an ever, increase, an ever existing scarcity of jobs of access to public services, et cetera, et cetera. That is uh, unnecessary, it's needless. 
we can organize the economy in such a way such that everybody has access to good, meaningful, well-paid work um, and robust universal public services. Um, and doing so would ensure that um, we, we feel at liberty to embrace our brothers and sisters who are escaping difficult lives and integrate them into our communities without feeling like there's some kind of competition between us, okay? Um, so I think, that, uh, I think that the kinds of policies that I'm calling for uh, would enable us to have a more humane, integrative approach to, uh, to refugees and, uh, and economic migrants and so on. Um, before I, before I disappear, I, I do want to add just one quick question, um, one quick uh, comment about strategy, because I, I know that somebody raised this earlier. Um, you know, the question that, that somebody raised was, if this is against the interests of the 1% um, who benefit from the economy as it presently is, how, how, do you, how can you ever hope to accomplish these objectives? Um, well, the first thing I would say is, um, is this, like, it's not necessary that we use the word degrowth in our public facing communication, in terms of our arguments uh, to, um, to politicians and so on, right? Uh, okay, um, uh, but what we can do is we can call for the specific policies that would bring about the kind of transition I'm talking about. So, um, so you don't have to talk about degrowth. Degrowth is important as an analytical term. You know, we need to have a conversation about it because it's analytically precise, okay? And it, it, it's, it's also, important to uh, throw off the ideology of growthism, but as public communication, it's not always necessarily the best tactic, okay? Uh, so, but for that, you focus on the policy. You call for the, uh, the public job guarantee, right? Nobody is against that. Uh, you call for universal public services. Nobody's against that. Um, you call for the decommodification of whatever, uh, internet or housing, et cetera. Uh, this broad support for this kind of thing. So you argue for the policies you want, um, uh, and then that creates space for you to reorganize the economy, okay? Um, so, but the other key thing to say here, I think, is this, is that, uh, is that we have to recognize that, you know, existing environmental discourse uh, has tended to be anti-working class, okay? Um, and, and what degrowth is, is powerful, like the reason degrowth is powerful is because it's a movement that we can, that, that, that engages working class consciousness. Um, we have to be able to recognize, right, that, um, uh, that, uh, that there's nothing worthwhile for workers about an economy that generates perpetual unemployment and that is organized around labor uh, dedicated to exchange value and elite accumulation, okay? Um, you know, I've been part of unions for my entire life. And I think that this is an important message we have to convey in the union movements is that degrowth is pro-worker, okay? It's about let's break free from the ideology that we should lash ourselves, our labor to the imperatives of capital accumulation and organize labor around human need and social well-being and ecological stability in solidarity with other people and with our non-human neighbors, okay? Um, I think that that is a more robust way of thinking about worker consciousness. And that should be a kind of message that we, that we disseminate within the union movement as part of our strategy. Because ultimately, who are the losers of the system? The losers are the poor. The losers are the working class. The, the losers are the wretched of the earth. And the constituency for arguing for a post-capitalist economy must be those people who are affected most by it. This cannot be an elite led movement. Um, we have to have a movement that's organized around reclaiming our economy from the 1%. Uh, and so think about, you know, the political constituencies we have to speak to, to, uh, to mobilize the transition we want to see. Well, I think you have... Uh... You finished with uh, magnificent claims because uh, there were some rhetorical questions about are really corporations are really interested about degrowth. Then you said that we shouldn't use degrowth, the term. And you also answered pretty good about a question stressing about the individual role. And you said, 
you talk about how people we can press on governments to embrace uh, the growth. Your final words uh, are perfect in this sense. You said that we should focus on, on policies, specific policies, measures. So uh, I'm looking again for any last question, but I think uh, we may wrap it here because your final consideration is the way, perfect way to answer to everybody. Jason, I would just, uh, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> Uh, because all of the flow of ideas and questions, but I would like to thank you to you and all the participants that have animated the chat. It's been really enriching your uh, communication. All the issues that have been raised are everyday issues when we speak about the growth, we find. Uh, coming from different actors, uh, corporations, uh, governments. So, Jason, thanks a lot for your time. I'm really glad that after two years trying to reach it to you, and, and that's all. Uh, before uh, finishing, many questions were raised about the certificates, uh, uh, pricings, but uh, thank you, Jason, and also to the translators, and Maggie and Raul, uh, for the work. Uh, without them, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you so much for having me, and it was good to engage with you all, and, uh, and thank you to both of the translators who, who helped out.